Eternal Sonata, originally called Trusty Bell Chopin's Dream in Japan, is a JRPG that was released on Xbox 360 in 2007 and PS3 in 2008. I think it's an extremely underrated game with tons of charm and great music as well as a fun battle system that stands out. It was developed by Tri Crescendo, who was a part of Tri-Ace's sound team, but then went on to create their own games like Eternal Sonata, as well as Fragile Dreams Farewell Ruins of the Moon on the Nintendo Wii. Of course, being initially responsible for Tri-Ace's music, the game they created was heavily influenced by music, from the world itself to the characters. Eternal Sonata takes place in the mind of Frédéric Chopin, a Polish composer born in 1810 who's responsible for popular music pieces such as Raindrop Prelude and Revolutionary Etude. Unfortunately, he passed away in 1849 from tuberculosis at the age of 39. Before I continue, this video will contain spoilers. Eternal Sonata is a pretty old game, and if you haven't played it yet, I doubt you will at this point, but there you go. The world of this game is dreamt by Chopin, and in this world, people gain magical powers when they are terminally ill. This causes people to fear those who can use powers because it's basically a death sentence, and they believe that they'll get sick too. Chopin is one of the people who has a terminal illness, but even still, he joins up with some friends and embarks on a journey to speak to the Count, who is basically the ruler, about this strange mineral powder that's supposed to be a medicine, but it's actually closer to poison, causing those who use it to turn into monsters. With people already struggling with money and sickness all around, they end up depending on this medicine, and it's all a huge exploit by Count Waltz. Chopin is the main character, but there are a lot of others. There's Allegretto and Beat, who steal bread from shops to give to poor kids in the sewers, there's also Polka, a young girl who also has a terminal illness, and is sad because she doesn't fully understand why people are afraid of her. There are also characters like Jazz, Claves, and Falsetto who join up later on in the story, and they're a part of a group called Andantino, who opposes the government, namely Count Waltz, because of his plan to provide the people with mineral powder, knowing full well what the consequences are. There's also Viola, a farm girl with a bow whose cattle have been killed by the monsters, as well as Salsa and Marge, the two twins of a go go forest. As for enemies, there's Fugue, a katana wielding psychopath, and Rondo, and they both work under Count Waltz. And there's also Dolce, captain of pirate ship Dolce, who is probably the best designed boss in the game. She kinda does her own thing and isn't really associated with Count Waltz, and she's just more of a recurring boss that she'll fight throughout the game. Back to Count Waltz though, he's this annoying kid who is somehow in charge of everything, and he leads the effort to get as much mineral powder as possible. He only cares about himself. Even his loyal servant Legato ends up taking his dangerous potion in order to turn himself into a dragon just because Waltz ordered him to do so. And have you noticed all the characters' names? As I said, this game is heavily influenced by music so basically everything is related to music in some way or another, like all of the characters' names. This even bleeds to the design of the characters. Allegretto, who you play as for most of the game, wields a sword that has strings, as well as Jazz, who wields a gigantic sword that looks like an actual instrument. And I do really like the character designs in this game, but they all do look kinda similar. They don't have super defining features outside of their hair and outfit. Their faces look very similar to the point where if you were to take away their hair, they'd all look the same aside from their eye colors. That's probably why their outfits are so wild in this game, which, you know, I'm fine with. As the story goes on, even more things come into play. Things like Chopin himself recognizing that his world isn't real, and that everyone in it is a figment of his imagination which during the final boss fight, you can see how that really disturbs him. There's also a whole story arc revolving around Polka and her existence being cyclical, where at the beginning of the game when she jumps off the cliff, she reverts back to her child form, and is greeted by her mother to live her life again. Does this story seem weird from my description? Well, it kind of is, though I still like it. It can be nonsensical at times, well, a lot of the times if I'm being honest here, but I think the story of Eternal Sonata is pretty okay. It's unique and does have some pretty memorable moments overall, even if it can be brought down by some confusing choices and awkward dialogue. The gameplay of Eternal Sonata is easily the most satisfying part of the game. It's not perfect, but manages to be fun and strategic. It's both real-time action as well as turn-based, and it's easy to learn. To get the basics out of the way, you're able to move your character around the field and attack your enemies with either a normal attack or a special attack. It's kind of mashy, but that's the fun of it. The good thing is, you don't have to charge up anything or wait to use your special attack. You can even spam it if you want. As you attack your enemies, you'll see a time gauge. As you move, the gauge decreases. If you stand still, it pauses. You're free to do whatever you want until that time runs out. After that, it's the enemy's turn. You also have access to using items as well as guarding, which is one of the most important aspects of battles in this game, because it relies on reacting to certain attacks. 
When it's time to guard, you'll see Chance flash on the screen for a split second, and you have to press the guard button at that moment to guard an attack. You can't mash the button either, because pressing guard at any moment before or after you see the Chance on screen will cancel it out. Some enemies will take advantage of your reaction timing by throwing out attacks in rapid succession, expecting you to guard every single one. Failing to block attacks will result in a game over in just a few seconds. This mechanic takes some time to master, but it's extremely satisfying to pull off. And that's combat in a nutshell. Except, it's not. One of the best features of this game is the fact that the combat system evolves throughout the entire story, through party level ups which are placed at specific points in the story. Remember when I said that if you stop moving the time gauge also stops? Well, once the game thinks you've gotten good enough at combat, that rule will no longer apply. Now, as soon as you take your first step, time will keep passing no matter what. And that's where tactical time comes in. It's a period right at the beginning of the battle where if you don't move at all, time won't flow. This will give you time to plan out your attack and what you want to do. Also, at this point in the game, you're introduced to the echo system. This is a mechanic where hitting your enemies with basic attacks will cause you to gain echoes, signified at the bottom right of the screen. If you keep attacking, the numbers will go up, maxing out at 32 echoes. Now, if you use a special attack, it will use up all of your echoes, but it will be much more powerful. Echoes are shared between the entire party, and building them up to the max and then cashing out will yield some amazing results. This encourages you to start off with your basic attacks and then use specials near the end of your turn. As you get further, tactical time eventually gets shortened and then removed entirely, and the amount of time you get to act is also shortened. You'll also be introduced to the light and dark system as well as counterattacking. Standing inside or outside of a shadow will allow you to use different special attacks, and some enemies can also change designs and stats entirely depending on if they're in light or in shadow. The only downside to this is basically every light move has a dark version that does the exact same thing. They're pretty much reskinned attacks that have different visuals and sound effects. As for counterattacks, you'll sometimes have the option to press a button to counter instead of guard. Countering an enemy has you take zero damage from the attack and makes them fall to the ground, ending their turn early. There are also harmony chains, which allow you to chain different special attacks one after another. At first, you'll only have access to three chains, but at the final party level, which you get near the end of the game at the optional dungeon, that number is increased to six. As I said, this is the most satisfying part of the entire game. Even after many hours in a game, the combat system is constantly bringing new ideas and mechanics to the table. I've never seen a JRPG that does this, and it's just awesome. I originally played Eternal Sonata on the Xbox 360 and then afterwards on the PS3. For whatever reason, the game was released on Xbox first in the West and Japan. Nowadays, I prefer to just play the PS3 version mainly because with its release came a few quality of life changes and extra content, such as extra costumes for Allegretto, Beat, and Polka, two extra playable characters with Crescendo and Serenade, an extra dungeon, added voice lines, and improved controls to switch between light and dark attacks, making it the definitive version of the game. Sadly, not a lot of people talk about this game anymore, and that sucks because this game to me is underrated. The soundtrack is amazing, which makes sense because Tri Crescendo used to focus on music in the past, and because the music is composed by Motoi Sakuraba, same guy that works on the Tales games. The characters aren't the most in-depth, but they work well enough for the story. And there's more to the game than I discussed in this video, but I wanted to give you guys a general idea of what this game was about. It only released on the Xbox 360 and PS3, so it's been stuck on 7th generation consoles for a while. And it kinda has that extremely niche feel to it now because of that. Like if I were to talk to somebody about this game in public, I feel like I'm like the only one who would recognize it. I doubt Bandai Namco is even looking at this game anymore, but seeing this get ported or remastered for current generation, That'd be pretty awesome. At this point, Track Crescendo is mostly a support developer, but I'd like to see another game like this developed by them, or at least with them on board. Eternal Sonata did have some issues, like what I mentioned earlier with the story. It's good, but for a lot of people, it didn't really make a lot of sense, and it was kinda weird overall. And even now with me, I still don't fully understand the entire story, and that's kinda fine though, because the game, everything else just shines for me. As you can see, I have a lot of fondness for this game. It pretty much is the only JRPG I've played on the PS3 that I can think of, and I think it's still really fun. The only thing holding it back is the fact that it's been over a decade since we got anything new with this game, and it's also stuck on decade-old hardware, with little chance of coming back. But hopefully they can make that happen at some point, but I'm not going to be holding my breath for that. 
Anyway guys, that's all I have to say on Eternal Sonata. Thank you so much for watching. If you liked this video, leave a like. If not, leave a dislike. And if you want to see more videos from my channel talking about a plethora of games on both PlayStation and Nintendo consoles, hit that subscribe button. Thanks for watching guys. See you in the next video. Thank you.